in Isaiah chapter 11. That's what we're going to focus on this morning. But if you look at the back of your bulletin, you can see there's other scripture that we're going to look at. As we take a look at a snapshot from the history of the people of God, the nation of Israel. And let me tell you, things could not have been worse. Things could not have been worse. The glorious hope of the people of Israel that the dynasty that was started when David was king, that it would continue throughout all of history. Well, that great hope had crumbled at their feet. The United Kingdom of Israel under David split in two at the death of David's son Solomon in about 922 B.C. before Christ. So there was Judah and Israel. Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And then the northern kingdom, the Assyrians came in about 200 years after the, the United Kingdom of Israel split in two. The Assyrians came in and destroyed the northern kingdom and took God's people into exile. The southern kingdom escaped until 587 B.C. And then the Babylonians came in and they destroyed the southern kingdom. They destroyed the city of Jerusalem the holy city of God. And they carted off God's people to Babylon. I told you, things could not have been worse. And in Psalm 137, a man of God sat down and he wrote this psalm. He wrote this psalm from Babylon. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and we wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplar trees we hung our hearts, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing for us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? I don't think I have to describe the emotions that the psalmist was experiencing when he wrote Psalm 137. And if you read the rest of the psalm, then you'll realize that the only hope he had, the only hope he had, was that God would destroy the Babylonians so that God's people might be set free. Things could not have been worse. All hope was gone from the hearts of God's people, and yet, and yet there was a glimmer of hope, there was a whisper of hope, because God had spoken through his prophets. And in Isaiah chapter 11, we hear a faint whisper from heaven that a new day is coming. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And by the time the ink was dry, on the last verse of the Old Testament, the prophet Malachi, why, the new day still had not come. It would be many years, many long and quiet years before the people of God would hear from God again. You see, maybe some of you are not aware of this. If you've got your Bible this morning, if you go to Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, and then you see Matthew on this page, the first book of the New Testament, there's 400 years between those two pages, between Malachi and Matthew. Bible teachers call them the silent years of God. The last prophet had spoken, and it would be many years. And with each passing year, throughout those 400 years, the silence of God grew more and more deafening. All hope was gone, and yet there remained that whisper, that quiet voice. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear great fruit. I hope that with all the information I've just shared with you about the history of the demise of Israel, when Israel cratered in 587 B.C., now certainly you're aware that today Israel is alive and well, amen? Amen. Because God was not done with his people. But hopefully because of what I've shared with you so far, then you realize 
you get a picture in your mind's eye of a shoot coming up from a stump. You know what a stump is, don't you? What was once a mighty tree full of life, a resting place for all kinds of living creatures. It had been chopped down to the ground with nothing left remaining except a decaying stump left as a reminder of what once was. And yet God said, a shoot will come up from the stump, the stump of Jesse. Now, God didn't say when, and God didn't say how. God simply gave his people a promise that he was not done with Israel yet. That whisper from heaven was intended to be a catalyst of hope for the people of God in the midst of what appeared to be an absolutely and utterly hopeless situation for all of them. Some of you have gathered here this morning and you're feeling like that stump that was spoken about by Isaiah. You stood strong for the longest of time, but somewhere along the way you've lost your strength. You've lost your tenacity. You've lost your will to fight. Now, like the once powerful Israel, you feel like your very life has been cut down. And as you stare into the mirror, you're reminded only of what was, not what could be, not what potential lies out there in the future somewhere, you've lost hope. And any expectations that you once had for a brighter tomorrow, they faded into the long forgotten past. For those of you that are here this morning, you've given up all hope. Or you're hanging on to the last thread of hope with all the strength that you can muster I want to ask you this morning, would you please open your heart to allow the Spirit of God to take the Word of God to teach you this morning? God's Word to serve as a catalyst of hope in the midst of your hopelessness. Would you allow God to do that this morning? Don't forget, don't you dare forget that whisper from heaven. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. And from his roots a branch will bear great fruit. I, I've not come here with easy answers. I, I'm not a motivational speaker who's come here to say, come on, reach down, deep, deep inside of you. Reach down, grab yourself by your bootstraps and pull yourself up. You've got it within you. You've got what it takes. I didn't come here to tell you that because I believe that's a lie. You don't have within you what it takes, and neither do I. But there is one who does. And this morning, if we will place our trust, no reservation trust in Jesus Christ, he can lead us where none of us can go. He can give us what none of us has if we will trust in him. I've sat with the exasperated. I've watched the life drain right out of people over the course of time to where they've given up hope. They've said, that's it. Mike, I'm done. I'm finished. As total. That's it. You know, just this past week, let me walk you through some of the blessings that have come my way this past week. On Wednesday morning of this past week, the sanctuary had people in it as we were celebrating the life of Lucille Greenlee. Her casket was right here where that communion table was at. She was 96 years old. And let me tell you, 96 is a long time, but it wasn't long enough for her family. They wanted more time. And then, the very next day, I get a text of this beautiful little baby. His name is Hunter Johnson. You'll see him one day. Tim's grandpa. Paul and Chelsea were blessed with a brand new little boy. And then, last night, this sanctuary was packed. Abby Ronk and John Crail stood here before God and all of their family, and there was joy, unspeakable joy, rising up. And as soon as I signed the marriage license, I left and I drove straight to Don and Jeannie Gardner's house where there was a house full of people. Every door was left open because it was so hot. There were so many people there. As for the 19th year in a row, we got together to commemorate that Christmas Eve when their son Don Don was killed in an apartment complex just north of here. Shot. Died Christmas morning. And let me tell you, from the funerals to 
the, the time at Don and Jeannie's house, from the birth of a baby to a great wedding celebration, God was present in both houses. And he was present in a powerful way because he rejoices with those who rejoice and he weeps with those who weep. And he calls you and me to do the same. See, I didn't come here today as some, some starry-eyed motivational speaker. I know what it's like to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And I'm telling you that he is our hope. He is our strength. He is our redeemer. How do you find the will to keep moving forward? When you, it just seems like one hope is dashed after another. How when you get your hopes up, they just get smashed down. How do you move forward? How do you find the way? Well, all of those situations that present themselves, they can drive us to either <clears throat> cling to some catchy cliche like you see on bumper stickers or to find a really good therapist who can walk us through those dark nights of the soul or to try and escape. <clears throat> or we can bring those troubles and trials to the one who is called the man of sorrows. And we can allow him to walk us through and to navigate those pressing, difficult times of life. You see, these are not hypothetical scenarios that we go through in life. They are real life pain. They're real life trials and troubles. This is Advent season. <clears throat> the word Advent means expectant waiting. We do two things during Advent. Number one, we celebrate the coming of Jesus. And we stand on our tiptoes in hopeful expectations, in expectant expectation that he's coming again. And it's not some kind of Disney tale he is coming again, and we hope it will be sooner than later. That's what Advent's all about. During the Advent season, we focus on hope and peace and joy and love. Those are more than just mere words. Folks, peace, hope, joy, and love, though that is the core of the expectation of the human heart. That's what we all long for. We long for peace. We long for joy. We long for love and we long for hope. And yet, in spite of all of our prayers, all of our efforts, it seems like hope, peace, joy, and love seem to remain just beyond our grasp. The clouds begin to clear after we've gone through a storm, after we've gone through a trial. The clouds begin to clear and our hopes begin to rise again only to have another storm brewing on the horizon. A season of peace and calm is torn to shreds by another storm of turmoil that comes our way. Happiness, which is oftentimes mistaken, mistakenly identified as joy, is snatched away by the sudden news that we need to brace ourselves for what is to come. In love, the long-awaited relationship that we've always dreamed about it's abruptly crushed beneath the weight of betrayal or rejection. In all of my years of working with people, I've come to recognize there is not an objective measuring tool that we can use to determine the line that separates hope from hopelessness. It's different in every human heart. Some people can go through the most excruciatingly painful things you could ever even imagine, and yet... They hold on to hope. They find meaning. And there are other people who go through storms, but, but they don't appear to you that it would rock your world, and yet they become utterly hopeless. In Vienna, Austria, there were three Jewish psychiatrists, two who were world famous at the time, and one was a young man really just getting started in his practice. Sigmund Freud had spent his lifetime studying human behavior. And he arrived at the conclusion that it was pleasure that drove all of the behaviors of man. We want to experience pleasure, and so everything that we do is done to bring us pleasure. The second world-famous psychiatrist was a man named Dr. Alfred Adler. And he too had spent his life studying human behavior, but he had come to a totally different conclusion than Sigmund Freud. Adler believed that people grow up feeling inferior and powerless. 
So he believed that deep in the human heart was a longing for significance, some kind of, of power to have an identity. That's what all people long for. And the up-and-coming psychiatrist that I was referring to, his name was Dr. Viktor Frankl. But before he really got started in his practice, he was taken away to a German concentration camp. Dr. Frankel had finished his residency in 1937 in neurology and psychiatry at the Steinhoff Psychiatric Hospital in Vienna. He was responsible, his, his, his sole responsibility was the suicide pavilion. That's what they called it at the hospital. He had seen during his residency some 30,000 women who had had suicidal tendencies. In 1938, Dr. Frankel was prohibited from treating Aryan patients because he was a Jew. And then, in 1940, Dr. Frankel, he was the head of the neurological department at the Rothschild Hospital, the only hospital that would treat Jews in Vienna. In 1942, he, his wife, and his parents, they were moved to a Nazi ghetto. And then just two years later, they were moved to Auschwitz. Dr. Frankel spent three years in concentration camp. And during those three years, he witnessed and experienced some of the worst treatment of humanity by humanity that he could have ever even imagined. Dr. Frankel knew what it was like to be starved. He knew what it was like to be subjected to bitter cold and to not have any clothing. He knew what it was like to be forced to do hard labor from sunrise past sunset. And he knew what it was like to watch friends and family members being herded into gas chambers. Dr. Frankel recognized that many of those who were housed at Auschwitz, they had lost all hope. All hope. And who could blame them? He also noticed that it wasn't the strongest, it wasn't the most fit people that survived all of that harsh treatment, but it was those who, have, who found meaning and purpose for their lives. Even facing certain death at the hands of the Nazis. He said that the difference between those who survived and those who didn't was hope. He noticed a difference even in the way people carried themselves in the prison camp. Even in the way people carried out their responsibility there at Auschwitz. Even with the horrific circumstances that they found themselves in, there were those who believed that one day it would all end. And that gave meaning to even what they did in the concentration camp. The thing, he came to the conclusion, Dr. Franco came to the conclusion that his mentors, Dr. Freud and Dr. Adler, they were wrong. It wasn't pleasure that drove humanity. It wasn't a, for a sense of power, of identity that drove humanity. No, 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 no. It was, it was meaning. My life is significant. I have purpose. There's purpose in what I do each and every day, even if nobody knows I exist. So Dr. Viktor Frankl decided that though he was a prisoner and he could face death any moment of any day that he was in the prison camp, while he was alive, he would help his fellow prisoners. He wrote in his book, Man's Search for Meaning. Listen to this. We who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer us significant proof that everything can be taken away from people but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, and that is to choose one's attitude regardless of the circumstances. To choose one's attitude, regardless of the circumstances. To choose one's own way. If you've ever seen the movies, Schindler's List, or Hotel Rwanda, or you've seen footage of the carnage of humanity being tortured and starved in war-torn nations, then you'll understand me when I say that there are conditions that would seem to make it impossible to have any hope. They would seem to make it impossible. And yet, and yet Dr. Frankel's testimony reminds us of that whisper from heaven. A shoot can come up from the stump. There is still hope, even when it looks like 
all hope is gone. There's still hope. You see what's rationally, cognitively, and emotionally appears to be impossible? It's more than possible. Dr. Victor Frankl is a living testimony, or he was. He survived the concentration camp. He got remarried. He's the only member of his family who made it out of Auschwitz. He remarried. He wrote more than 25 books after he got out of prison camp. He founded a school of, psych of psychiatry in Vienna. And he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning that has been translated into 23 languages. It sold more than 9 million copies. He traveled the world until he was past 90 years old, teaching and lecturing about hope. There's all kinds of things that people try and use to bring significance, to bring some kind of meaning to their life. But if you've been around Britain Christian Church any amount of time, then you know that I believe that I'm absolutely convinced that there is only one who can give us not only hope in this life, but hope and meaning for all of eternity. All of these other things, they may get you through these life, through this life, but it's only Jesus that can not only give you hope and meaning and purpose in this life, but he can give you hope and meaning and purpose through all of eternity. What a wonderful blessing. The Apostle Paul wrote to his friends in Philippi, and he shared with them these words. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. Paul found meaning and purpose in life when he had a full belly and when he was starving to death because of his relationship with Jesus. Jesus changes everything because Jesus changes our perspective. Jesus gives us new eyes to see, a new mind to think with <clears throat> that we don't have before we come to know Christ. You see, folks, there all of us as people, all seven and a half billion people on the face of the planet, regardless of whether they're Muslim, Hindu, Jew, atheist, Buddhist, Christian, it doesn't matter. God causes his reign to fall on the just and the unjust for all people. We all, all people, go through trials and troubles and tribulation. And the natural response of all people, somebody needs to hear this this morning. The natural response of all people when we go through troubles is to respond by saying, why me? Why me? And to look around and to find people that are not going through trouble and to say, why not them? But you see, when we come to know Christ, and, and I know this, I know there's a popular school of Christianity today that says that if you'll just have faith, that if you'll just draw closer and closer to Jesus, then you can avoid the troubles and trials and heartache of your life. You just need to take dominion over that. My friend, that is baloney. Baloney. Let me spell it for you. B-O-L-O-G-N-E. I hope that's right. It's baloney. Let me explain to you why. Very simply. We are to follow in Jesus' steps. Where did those steps lead him? To a cross. to a garden called Gethsemane where there were sweat drops that fell from his forehead, where he was mocked. He was run out of town. Even those closest to him, those that slept, ate, drank, walked with him for three years, it was one of them that turned him in. And you think you're going to get out of here scot-free? We follow a nail-scarred Savior, and you will be scarred as well. You will endure the troubles, the tests, the trials of life. Here's the difference. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. So when we go through the trials of life, the Holy Spirit reminds us, you're not in this by yourself, Hawks. He 
is leading you through this, and he will lead you to the other side. So all of that popular Christianity stuff, don't listen to that. You listen to the Word of God. It's so interesting to me. When we begin to learn the Word of God, then when we go through the trials of life, we're reminded of James chapter 1. <clears throat> Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, because you know, not you feel, you know that the testing of your faith, it develops perseverance. It develops Christian strength. And this past Wednesday, when we gathered in the sanctuary and Lucille's casket was before us, we grieved, but we were reminded of what Paul wrote to the people in Thessalonica. He wrote to those brothers and sisters, and he said, My friends, I want you to know about those who die, and I want you to know for a reason. I want you to know about those who die so that you will grieve, but not like those who have no hope. Not like those who have no hope. For we gathered around Lucille's casket, and we remembered what Jesus said, that he had gone to prepare a place for her. Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and if it were not so, I would have told you but I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back for you so that you may be where I'm going. And in Revelation 21, God reminds us that in that place, he wipes every tear from every eye. And there's no more mourning. There's no more dementia. There's no more cancer. There's no more sorrow. There's no more death. There is only joy and unspeakable joy in our Father's presence. And that's where our sister is right now. You see what God's Word does to us? God's Word, God's Spirit changes our mind. There were false teachers who were plaguing the church in Paul's day. It's really interesting. They were going around saying bad things about him. And Paul responded. He said, am I not a teacher also? Are they servants of Christ? I am too. And then you know what Paul does? He puts together a resume. But it is the strangest resume you've ever seen in your life. If you're going to go apply for a job, you're going to put together all the bullet points of the highlights of your life, right? You're not going to list all the times you were fired. You're not going to list all the times you royally messed up. You're going to list all the highlights. Listen to what Paul writes to the people in Corinth. Here's his resume. Here's his credentials. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled. I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst, and I've often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all of the churches. Who is weak, and I do not feel weak, who is led into sin, and I do not inwardly boast, burn. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Isn't that ironic? Paul doesn't list on his resume all the wonderful things he's done. He talks about what he suffered for the cause of Christ. Do you realize in our day and age, if you mention those things in some circles today, they would say, well, you just need to have more faith. You need to take dominion over those things. That's not God's will for you to go through that. How could Paul see these? Being whipped, being beaten, being hungry. How could he see those as signs of the work of God in his life? Because God had spoken to Paul. When Paul was given a thorn in the flesh. Paul said, take it from me, God. Not once, not twice, over and over again, three times. God, take it with me. 
take it from you. And God spoke to Paul. And this is what he said in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. For my power is made perfect in weakness. God's power is made perfect in weakness. So those of you that are strong, you see, it's not strength God is looking for. He's looking for the broken. He's looking for the weak. I don't know what it is that you're going through this morning. Is it health concerns? Are you exhausted from doctor's visits and still they can't find anything out? Are you exhausted from chemotherapy, radiation, a weakened physical state that seems to be growing weaker with time? Or is it relational pain? Have betrayal and rejection bound you up in chains that just feel inescapable to you? Do you have a loved one who's on the roller coaster of addiction and they're dragging you along for the ride? Do you have a child who's struggling in school? In a school of hundreds of kids, he can't find one friend? Serious? Maybe it's not the fact that he can't find a friend. Maybe it's the fact that you found a friend in his teacher who it seems like calls you every week. Can you come to the school and meet with me because of your child's behavior? Oh, have hope. You know the first time my mom and dad ever got a phone call from school? I was in kindergarten. Punched a kid in the nose. Gave him a bloody nose in class. Charlie and Glenda Hayes, would you come up and meet with me? Your kid in kindergarten is acting up. You know the last time my mom and dad got a phone call from the school? It was the day before graduation. Now, you all know me really well, but I was allegedly accused of starting a food fight in the school cafeteria. Allegedly. It wasn't true. I tell you what, my mom and dad were so glad to see me leave and go to college, but not for the same reasons your mom and dad were glad to see you leave. They said, I, we got to get this kid out of our hair. I don't know what your struggle is this morning. But I do want to give you some counsel. And it's the same counsel that the psalmist gave himself. In Psalm 42, verse 11, read this with me. Everybody out loud. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Stop, stop. If the psalmist would have stopped there, then we would be hopeless. We'd be utterly hopeless. But he continued. Continue with me. Put your hope in God. Again, put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. And you say, but Mike, what evidence can you give me that that's wise to put my hope in God? I'm so glad you asked. Because when we as people put our hope in ourselves, it may or may not work out. And ultimately, it won't work out. Let me assure you of that. Ultimately, it won't work out. But when you put your hope in God, you have no idea how, you have no idea when, but you can stand on the promises of God knowing that they are certain. Certain. You remember that whisper from heaven? A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. A branch from his roots will bear fruit. And then one day, one day, that quiet reminder becomes a thunderous announcement. For unto you a child is born. And his name shall be called. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. You see, God's true to His promises. This morning, if you're here and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, my friend, don't leave. Christmas has come early for you this year. Just get up from your seat, come to the front, give me your hand as you give Jesus your heart. Or if you're here this morning, you're looking for a church home. You don't have a church home? We will welcome you with open arms. Just come forward. Let me know that. Mike, we want to we become part of this church family. 
as we stand and sing this song of invitation, won't you come?